Uh, we're going to give an overview of our green paper. Uh, Karen and myself, uh, our editors, as well as Christine Rollick. We had 33 contributors from Agriculture in Canada, uh, Canadian Wheat Board, Province of Alberta, and the University of Manitoba. As you'll notice, a bunch of us are PAGs from Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba. And we did this coordinated through the National Center for Livestock and the Environment. Why 2050? Well, we sat down and David posed this challenge to us about looking at adaptation in the future. And we said, let's pick a point in time that we can relate to. 35 years from now, a lot of young producers are just starting out now. We'll be in the business. Some of our mid-career pr uh, producers will still be around. We usually can relate to things that happened about 35 years ago. At least some of us can. Um, it's sort of within our conceptual grasp. But let's look at that possibility of 2050. Also, the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, has been giving us projections at different times, and 2050 is one of those cut points that we actually have a lot of data on. Over the last few days, you may have heard a lot more articles in the news about the IPCC. They've been releasing their fifth assessment. So uh, in the fall, we had the uh, working group on the physical basis. Just recently, we had the adaptation. Next week, they'll be meeting about the mitigation, and there'll be a synthesis report later in the fall. So these are very topical things that are coming around, and I encourage you to go to their website to really look at the details. Adaptation versus mitigation. A little later on today, I think you'll hear a lot more talks about mitigation, and Karen and I both work on mitigation. But I'm going to leave that aside for the moment. So mitigation is what we can do about a change in climate. Adaptation is about how we're going to adapt to whatever happens, and we believe we're in a situation where we need to adapt. Things are happening. What's the role of agrologists? As agrologists, our role is to give good advice to all our customers. So we really should be looking at climate change knowledge as one of those tools in our portfolio. I'm going to try to capture this science of climate change very briefly. Basically, we have three human-caused gases that are increasing the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane. And the sources of those are primarily from fossil fuels, although agriculture does contribute perhaps about 10% globally. It is important to realize that we should be mitigating those also in agriculture, but if we did not have the fossil fuel emissions, we wouldn't even have in this discussion. So the agricultural component is actually quite small related to what the atmosphere sees. We have these recent climate change projections from IPCC, and we now let's look at this sort of as an idea about radiative forcing. Radiative forcing really means when you add these gases to the atmosphere, they absorb that radiation that's being emitted by the Earth, warms the atmosphere, and then causes a radiative effect. And what the IPC does in their fifth assessment is they show a graph, as you see on the right-hand side, that says, over time, what is that radiative forcing, depending on what scenarios you estimate is going to happen with our release of fossil fuels? Now, for our scenario here, we pick something called a concentration pathway 4.5, which means that by the year 2100, we believe that if you release a certain amount of CO2, methane and N2O, we would be having an extra 4.5 watts per square meter for the globe that's going to actually warm. And that's going to give us about a 2 degree increase by the year about 2050. To date, we're looking at something like between 0.6 and 0.8 degrees from uh, a baseline of, say, be slightly before 1800. One thing I should just mention that even though we pick a different scenario, that by 2050, most of the scenarios have very similar values as far as the warming. The real changes, depending on the scenario, starts happening after that. We're going to just pick 2050 as our baseline. There's been lots of work done on the prairies on adaptation to climate change. The Prairie Adaptation Research Collaborative, about 10 years ago roughly now, did a lot of really good work, a lot of detailed work on climate change in the prairies, and most of the scenarios and analysis they did are still valid today. But since then, we've got some really good reports out of the U.S., we've got a new report on water in Canada, we've got some government reports. There's lots of work being done, so I just encourage you to go back and read those details. We're not going to repeat them here today. What I'd like to do, though, is summarize what we think that prairie climate could look like in 2050. Two things to think about, weather versus climate. Climate is that long-term change we're looking at that we actually use for planning. 
Weather is that stuff that happens to us every day, the ups and downs, the things that affect our crops, affect our transportation, all those kinds of things. They go together, but the weather part really is what we often relate to. We have lots of uncertainty. When we look at some of these models, we say, how do we know what's going to change? IPCC is saying, basically, if we look at what's happened in natural variability over the last 20 years, if our projection is going to be within one standard deviation of that, let's say there's no change. So that's how we're going to set that up. So what would happen then is that we'd say for the prairies, we're likely to get an annual temperature change of an increase of perhaps between 1 and 4 degrees, most likely between 2 and 3 degrees. Our current standard deviation is about 1, so you can imagine that 2 degrees is greater than our natural variability right now. Little change in precipitation is a projection, but it still has consequences and a real uncertainty related to change in variability. That's the thing that we're really uncertain about. We believe there'll be a lot more variability globally, but when it comes down to a region like the prairies, it's very hard to estimate those things. So what could this look like? For the prairies, we believe there'll be a decrease in the heat limitations, which we have right now for a lot of our crops, but an increase in moisture limitations. So even if precipitation stays the same, Evapotranspiration ends up going up because it's warmer and we end up having a drier environment. One of the concerns we call about is the acceleration of the water cycle. When we have more evapotranspiration, things cycle a lot quicker. That essentially perhaps causes extra storms. A lot more things are happening that we didn't see previously. We believe for agriculture in the prairies there's opportunities and there's going to be challenges. So depending on what you're trying to grow or what you're trying to do, there will be a difference and we have to explore both. We have to adjust for those challenges and also explore the opportunities. But we also think we're in a pretty fortunate place. Chances are globally, globally in other parts of the world, they are actually going to suffer a lot more. And we start thinking about what our responsibility is towards those other parts of the world, but also we're going to be a little insulated. Uh, last December in uh, Winnipeg, uh, we had our local Manitoba agronomist conference and their theme was, Will Manitoba be the new Iowa? Kind of interesting. We've seen corn and soybeans moving north, and people looking at that, well, what will that change be? Well, I want to show you some uh, very recent data from a colleague of mine, Jigfeng Xiao from University of New Hampshire, and uh, he's just, just uh, getting ready to submit this to a journal very soon. And what he did, he took North America and calculated annual photosynthesis, so how much our vegetation is taking up, how much CO2, for 13 years, 2001 to 2012, and averaged it. And the colors you see are the greens are going to be high photosynthesis, and those pinks in the middle are low. And when you look at the prairies, you see what's happening as far as those bullseyes go, basically, where this area here looks a lot drier. That lower photosynthesis is really caused by lack of moisture. Now, if you're an optimist, a lot of us would like to think that this black circle on the right-hand side that green area is going to move north because it's going to be warmer and things are going to be really great and we're going to get a lot more photosynthesis. But most people would say that it's more like that circle on the left, that's the one that moves north, or that pink area actually expands. So even going into Manitoba, we actually see a lot drier conditions. So we have this picture, and I know you can stare at this picture forever, trying to find your house in front of you know, parks, see what Cypress Hills are doing, all those things. But it's a pretty neat uh, data set that's based on remote sensing uh, and land cover and it's cali calibrated against flux towers where we actually know that CO2 uptake. So where are we at? Well, right now in our prairie system, our ag land is a little more than 50% of it is crops, about a third of it is pasture. We have some other land for different purposes, some but it's drowned out. Uh, water is a, a real important resource and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. We're export based. Uh, we actually have adapted to climate. We can argue perhaps that canola was really developed because we had this colder climate and that's really uh, one of those responses. And think about 35 years ago, that was just the start of canola. Almost half of our operators now are over 55, but the young operators are actually operating a lot different. They tend to have more money, they work off the farm and on the farm, they're actually in a very different environment. And they tend to be wired. Karen and I were in a meeting with the producer uh, last fall, and the producer said to us, you know, you can get rid of all my technology, just leave me my smartphone and Twitter. That's all I need. And he said, well, why? And he says, I took a picture of an insect, 
on a plant, I tweet it out, in five minutes some expert somewhere in the world tells me what it is and what to do about it. So the whole environment's a lot different. Well, in our green paper, we decided that none of us can really see the future very well. That crystal ball on the right is um, a bright sunshine recorder. Most of you have never seen one. In the old days, we used to have this lens. Sun would shine through it. It would burn a piece of paper, tell us how, many, how much uh, burn was on there, how many hours of bright sunshine. I put this out uh, beside our building on the first day of spring. It's in a snowbank. Two years ago, that would have been on a golf course. It was totally green. We've seen this up and down. So we think there's some value in a diversity of opinions of what the future is going to look like. And most of us are not going to have a really good vision. So we solicited these thoughts from agricultural experts in their specialty area, asking basically four questions. What's going on? What's coming up? Does it matter? And what's being done? Or what can we do about it? So I'm briefly just going to give you a bit of a snapshot on some of these ideas. And I'm going to start one about temperature variability. I mentioned that we're going to have a warming climate, and winters tend to look like they're going to warm a little more than summers. But let's look at natural variability, and I arbitrarily just picked Edmonton for the last 50 years. So that graph on the left looks at the January mean temperature, and there's a bit of a trend. Your eyeballs can pick the trend up, but look at the ups and downs. That's a January mean. And I'm talking about maybe having a three degree increase, but think about the year to year variability that we actually adapt to right now. If you look at the uh, graph on the right, I'm always amazed that the maximum temperatures tend to not vary very much. They're in that, you know, close to 10 degree range. Some day in January always gets that 5 to 10. But it's those low temperatures that are actually varying a lot more. And quite often we say, it's not that we're getting warmer perhaps in winter, but we're getting less cold. So the minimums are actually changing. So that really, that variability we adapted to, and looks like we have to keep on adapting to it. Perhaps that's going to shift up, but we have to adapt to it. Well, a key question is severe weather. And if we think about what it takes to really get those severe storms, it's at least in summer, we need a little of a moisture, some instability in the atmosphere to sort of get this stuff moving around, a front perhaps that's going to trigger something happening to get some convection, and some wind shear. And there is evidence that that low-level moisture has been changing, and I mentioned before about that increase in the hydrological cycle, and those are one of those rest, uh, parts of the ingredients to actually make that storm actually happen. However, we cannot easily attribute any single event to climate change. You'll hear it in the radio or the TV all the time, people say, you know, this storm was that, this storm was this. It really is hard to do that attribution. We look at trends, but a single attributions are very, very difficult. Water is probably going to be the big story. As you know, it's either too much or too little. Water quality is also important. Um, we looked at, we used to, when in a course I teach, we used to use data from Manitoba crop insurance on crop claims, crop insurance claims. If you look at the split, the water split, was 70% of the claims were caused by water. 35% is too much, 35% is too little. That's how it used to be. In the last seven or eight years, it's almost all too much water, believe it or not. And we live in an area where actually we have a water deficit for growing even wheat. So that too much becomes a really big deal. I mentioned precipitation may not change much, but evapotranspiration will. And we have all kinds of other tools. We often play, a lot with, play around with drainage. We worry about runoff. We don't play around so much with infiltration, unfortunately. Uh, the photograph I have here is actually a pilot project being done in Manitoba. We're actually working with individual producers. We're looking at capturing some of that runoff on the spring, holding it in a dugout, and using it later on, and plus having some wetlands in there. The whole idea is to slow nutrients come off the landscape by actually slowing that water flow from spring snowmelt. The crop story. Some of our experts believe that wheat, barley, canola are probably still going to dominate. It's kind of an interesting story, meaning 35 years ago, who would have thought canola would be like number one? Uh, of course, we have some opportunities coming in with some of the warmer crops like soybean and corn. Sorghum and millet, perhaps they'll be coming in there too. And we have this question, what's breeding going to do? So still, we rely on a very long breeding period to actually come to new cultivars. But when we look at all the technology coming around, 
How will that speed up? And can we find those traits that are going to help us adapt? Pests. Uh, we brought in some experts that look at weeds, fungi and bacteria, nematodes, and insects. And it's kind of interesting that most of those people picked a story within their area. So for example, if you have warmer winters, let's think about winter annual weeds. All of a sudden, we're into a very different new, uh, story. Uh, fungi and bacteria, they're very much dependent on both moisture and temperature. And once you get that sweet spot for their development, increase in temperature a little bit, it becomes a bigger problem. Nematodes, that's a real problem we have with some crops, we're worrying about basically importing of nematodes, but also having a different soil environment. One thing we know is that we're still going to have freezing soils, so those subtropical and tropical things really are not going to be bothering us. And of course, we uh, look at all kinds of things that happen with insects, and even mites on honey honeybees. Cattle, again, uh, one of those stories that overwintering, there could be some advantages, but that moisture makes a huge difference on forage availability. So it is one of those stories that you have to bring the cattle and the forage together. Some concerns about possible changes to, uh, to disease, some of those uh, disease spores that are in the soil overwintering better and causing some problems in the future. So even though we often look at that primary production part, when you really look at the customer, what do they really want? If the customer demands something from a company, what kind of quality do they want? And one of our food scientists, Martin Scanlon, just came up with that idea. He says, you know, what's in a back Big Mac meal? And he starts looking at those things, and that quality control just for the French fry part makes a huge difference on what that climate is and what that weather is this year, and whether you're going to have water, whether you're going to have energy for processing, uh, even whether we're going to have more bacterial infections, say, on the lettuce that we're actually using to put on our Big Mac. It's a very interesting uh, take on how we look at that food processing part. Then there's all the supports. This year, as you all know, transportation is key. The rail lines alone, so here you are, increased crop, we're having a problem moving it. That's something we had to keep in mind, that we had to put that stuff together, that even though I may sometimes say we'll get increased yields, if we can't sell that crop and move it, that's a problem. Our ports, again, sea level rise is going to cause some challenges in other parts of the world. Uh, trade's critical, and a lot of our trade agreements are still regional. It's really hard to get those broader global trade agreements. How is insurance going to cope? That's a real key part, not just crop insurance, but the reinsurance. And there's a host of other things you can think about from machinery to uh, fertilizer availability that's going to come in there. So let's just summarize some of this stuff for the moment. And we're talking about climate, so that prairie agriculture, yeah, climate's really critical to us. But one thing we can think about is that we think we know the direction the climate's going, but what about the population? And we believe that by 2050, our population globally will be more like 9 billion, about 7 billion now. Prairie population will also grow. And if you had to bet on things, I would say the two things we know pretty well is climate and population as far as direction. And then you look at all the other drivers in there and you start saying they're way less predictable. So what about how our trade's going to be? What about technology? What about the politics? It's all in a global type of environment. Um, it becomes the real tough part for us to move along. Thank you, Brian. Well, accepting that change has a number of drivers that can act individually or in combination. We have to consider how adaptation may occur in the future. And we're most comfortable with adaptation or change as it happens at an incremental level. Uh, minor modifications uh, to processes or technologies or perhaps uh, a social structure uh, designed to improve something like competitiveness or quality of a product or perhaps quality of life. I've given some examples. Uh, if we look at biological efficiency, it's what we're familiar with, those one to four or five percent improvements in crop yield. Um, perhaps it's associated with uh, improved diet formulations to increase animal productivity or efficiencies. In the area of technology, there continue to be advances. The one that we often talk about are some of the uh, technologies around uh, spraying and our capacity to move from sort of field level spraying to spot spraying or perhaps even uh, more, more precise point spraying. And socially, we always see changes in regulations or incentives 
And uh, an example might be uh, water valuation changes or water use restrictions, some of those kinds of things. We're reasonably comfortable with that kind of change and can adapt to that. But as um, the Honourable Grant Mitchell mentioned, it can also be a big shift, a radical change, and World War II would have been an example of that. When we talk about these larger shifts, it's usually as a result of something major that's happened. It could be a discontinuance of a technology or process. Uh, for, for Canada, that could be a ban on the use of antibiotics and livestock feeds, as an example. Um, it could be, could be a, an opportunity through technology that allows us to start producing some of our grains and oil seeds with perennial plants, which could open up grasslands that really have uh, limited capacity for energy and protein generation in, our, in the current uses, totally revolutionizing how we might use those. Um, it certainly can happen on the technology front. Uh, Ten years ago, even, uh, most of us would say there is no way society is going to move to uh, meat alternatives. But we're now in sort of third and upcoming fourth generation extrusion technologies that are actually putting product into processed foods that are almost indistinguishable or are indistinguishable from, from real meat. And so there's a real opportunity for society to, to force a shift, right? Um, or uh, you've probably heard about the uh, in vitro meat where we now have the technology to stimulate muscle uh, protein uh, development uh, in vitro. And uh, these kinds of technologies can bring very rapid and sudden shifts. I've given the example of um, banning the use of um, feed-based antibiotics, but it could also be that something natural occurs, that the Rocky Mountains are no longer providing the river water, and that there is um, uh, no opportunity, no, no right to access river water for agriculture production. Those kinds of things are all a possibility in the future. And when we talk about adaptation, we have to be comfortable with the fact that the resiliency um, is, is focused on our capacity to adapt across a broad range of change.